Good morning. That's a little more better. All right. Good to see you here this morning. Go over a couple of announcements with you. One, tonight we have a churchwide fellowship, cake and ice cream. We're going to ask you to bring one or the other. Don't, we don't want too much cake or ice cream. But yeah, I don't know if you have, ever have too much of that. But yeah, so come tonight for cake and ice cream. That sounds like a, a good, good calorie-filled night. Uh, a little sugar rush, okay? But uh, that'll be tonight. You can see the other uh, items there in the, um, in the bulletin. Uh, Team Kid starts this Wednesday uh, Senior Adults Luncheon on Tuesday. Uh, they want to take make note of this. Um, two things. One is we've had the Oklahoma group with us, and uh, y'all just been a blessing. They uh, they wanted to bless us for letting us stay here, and um, they gave um, eight hundred and seven dollars worth of cards to our to for the youth open house, and so I was just really thankful for them. Just really, they gave to us and uh, to be able to do that. So we're gonna we're gonna use that and get a bunch of stuff on this. So we're gonna revise some of the uh, deal. Our open house is uh, pushed back partly. It's not quite ready. We want it to be ready for you to come see it. So we'll let you know. It won't be next Sunday, uh, but we'll let you know when that open house will be, and we'll be a revised list of some things we need. And and uh, but uh, just real thankful for them and in their hearts and, and doing that. It's just a really special, special thing. Uh, but at this time, now, if you would, uh, take your attention to the baptistry. It's a time in which we remember those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice and oddly enough, when you think about baptism, it's a picture of the ultimate yeah. sacrifice. And so uh, what we believe in as a faith is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, that one died so that we could live. And at the same point, as we celebrate Memorial Day weekend, we remember that many died so that we could live. I want you to stand with me right now, if you would. And let's remember... Let's stand in honor. Father, we do thank you for the multitude of men and women for decades, centuries now, that have died on the battlefields of this world, that we could worship on a Sunday morning in South Louisiana. God, they didn't know that's what they were doing, but that's what they did. And we thank you for them. And God, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, who 2,000 years ago knew his death would make today have meaning. We thank you for those who sacrificed, the men who've died, but most of all the Savior who died, but also rose again. And we praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Today as we baptize, uh, I want to mention this to the multitude before we uh, talk about the one coming. Uh, today is a day, if you've never been baptized, that you need to think about the fact you need to follow through with this. What is baptism? Baptism is a statement. That's, that's all it really is. It, it, it doesn't change you physically. The, the water is no more special water in here uh, than any other uh, water you have. I mean, this comes from the same tap that our water comes from. But it rec it's recognized to be symbolic of a change. All who ever came to know the Lord were baptized. Uh, before his time, John the Baptist called for people to be baptized, a statement, I want to be changed. Uh, even before that, those who converted to Judaism were, were baptized as a statement of conversion. And so baptism is an outward statement of an internal change of heart. And in the case of us as believers in Jesus, it's a statement of our conversion and our sacrifice of ourselves to him. And so if you've never been born again, today would be a day to do that. But secondly, if you have been born again but have never followed through with baptism, uh, today would be a time today when we have the invitation that you would be known by coming and saying, I want to follow through and be obedient.
This is Jay Sellers. If you were here last Sunday, Jay came at the end of the service, uh, shared that a number of years ago he had made a decision to follow Christ, but had not made the next step, and that he wanted to do that. And so today we follow through with that next step, which is him identifying before man uh, that he has accepted Jesus Christ as Lord. So let me ask you, Jay, before all these people, do you know today that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. Jay, because of your profession of faith in Jesus, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised again with Christ unto newness of life. Praise the Lord. What a blessing it is. I wish we did that every service. Church, let's always carry the name of Jesus. Because we have young people and old people. We have people that made decisions that never followed through. Let us do what we can to help them do what God wants them to do, which is follow Him in obedience. Let's pray, and then after I pray, we will uh, go ahead and begin our time of worship. My Father in heaven, I do thank you for Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Lord, who died and rose again, who paid the ultimate sacrifice. And as we worship now, God, let us not only remember what he did, but but God, realize we're a blessed people in this country to have the privilege, God, to walk in the doors of this building without fear uh, of danger, without fear of being taken, without fear of being thrown in jail, Uh, that, God, we have freedom, but freedom is costly. And, And God, let us realize we too must pay the price. So today, speak to us deeply. And help us now as we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Christ, 
I think upon your sacrifice, you became nothing, poured out to death. Many times I've wondered at your gift of life, and I'm in that place once again. And I'm in that place once again. And once again I look upon the cross where you died. I'm humbled by your mercy, and I'm
flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder, blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be. Burn 
burn like a fire I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression I speak Jesus Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets. Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. And Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. And Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus, cause your name is Let's practice that song. There's something about that name. Just say the name with me. Jesus. Jesus. Say it again. Jesus. One more time. Jesus. You know, I think that is a great thing to do when life overwhelms and when you just need something to fill the void and when you're just taken by everything else. Just stop and do what? Jesus. I encourage you to do that. Take your Bibles. We're in John chapter 12. We'll also be in John 16. And let's honor the reading of God's Word uh, by looking at these two passages. John 12, verse 23. Let's stand. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Chapter 16, verse 1. 
All this I have told you so that you will not go astray. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. I did not tell you this at first because I was with you. Let's pray. Oh God, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus who told us of his own sacrifice and ours. And God, today we live in a world that needs the church to rise, but rising comes with sacrifice. And uh, God, today let us understand that uh, we're, we're here today in Bayou Vista Baptist Church because of multitudes of people who sacrificed to put us here. And we're here because of the Savior who died on the cross. Speak to us today, Father. May we be challenged to the core of who we are in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. I grew about, up about the distance from where you're seated to the Morgan City Bridge from the site of the Battle of New Orleans. And many of you will be familiar with that. On January the 8th, 1815, uh, Andrew Jackson and the militia that he brought together, really a ragtag crew, fought against the British, which was the, really the final battle of the War of 1812. It never should have happened. Actually, the war was declared over, but communication as it was didn't allow the British to get the word, and so they had senseless deaths. But, but nonetheless, Andrew Jackson was the hero of the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, thus, he becomes a president in the future. That's why we have Jackson Square in the heart of the French Quarter, uh, right where I grew up within a half a mile of the battlefield is Andrew Jackson High School. All of that honoring the fact that um, Andrew Jackson and many, many people came together to sacrifice for the country. Now, it's called the Battle of New Orleans because that site, as the bird flies, is probably two miles from the city limits today of the city of New Orleans. Now, I've been to the battlefield a number of times over the years. There's a nice obelisk. By the way, how many have been there? I'm just curious. How many have been to the site? Okay, a portion of you have. There's a nice obelisk that's a, a reminder of where it happened. There's a rebuilt antebellum home. The original home is actually in the river now, but uh, they built this home as a monument. Uh, there's a museum there, and then they have cannons that line where the, the battle took place. And a lot of people went out there when I was growing up, and kind of like here when you have proms and dances, you go to the river. Well, in my day, people went to the battlefield because it was kind of a neat place to take pictures, and it was picturesque, and it was a reminder in the antebellum home. And so, you know how it is, when something's there your whole life, you don't think a lot about it. But let me tell you what's really sad, and I think of this now as it's Memorial Day weekend, right next to the site of the Battle of New Orleans, which is a national park, is also another national park. It's the Chalmette National Cemetery. Uh, the cemetery is just to the south uh, of the battlefield. It was established in 1864. Initially, it was the final resting place of Union soldiers who died during the Civil War, and today it has 14,000 headstones that mark the graves of the War of 1812, which was the Battle of New Orleans, the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, World Wars I and II in Vietnam, 14,000 headstones. Now, I want to say this, and I say this actually with a, a little bit of embarrassment. I lived within three miles of the National Cemetery my entire childhood, and I do not recall ever going there. I, uh, I went to the Battle of New Orleans site because it's a little cooler, if you know what I'm talking about. You get the cannons and the obelisk and... You have the, the antebellum home, which is pretty, and it's wide open, and lots of people go there for that. But I, to this day, if I did, I don't remember ever going to the National Cemetery, which had no cost. All I had to do was go through the gate, and I could have spent all kind of time there seeing the names of people I never knew who died in battles long before I was born, but I never did. Uh, the battlefield and the National Cemetery are both on what is called St. Bernard Highway, which changes names and it becomes St. Claude once it, it's into the city of New Orleans and later becomes Rampart Street. And, and so if many of you are familiar with that, it goes right next to the French Quarter, comes right out of Chalmette uh, in, in Araby and, and then New Orleans. Four-lane highway passes it every day. I passed it for years. 
and do not think I ever went to the cemetery. Let me tell you why I didn't. I didn't know anyone in there. I didn't know anyone in there. It didn't have a personal connection to me. Uh, Tamalee and I got married in uh, 1987, so I was a month shy of turning 22. I was a kid. You know, when you're that age, you don't think about it. I could have gone there countless times. I could have meandered amongst the tombstones of people that died for our country in World War I and World War II in Vietnam, and I didn't. It never crossed my mind. And now that I'm much older and I think back, it's like, Steve, why didn't you go? And the reason I didn't go is because I just never thought about it. You know, I think as we approach tomorrow and Memorial Day, most of us are totally oblivious of the sacrifice that was paid for you to be here this morning. Most of us do not even think about it. Now, as we get older, we do. But in our younger years, or maybe we just get callous by life, but we, we go through life as being those who've benefited from sacrifice, but don't really think about who gave it. A number of years ago, we were pastoring up in Manny, Louisiana, and the, the local authorities uh, decided to bring in the portable Vietnam Memorial Wall. It goes all over the country. Maybe some of you have seen it. I think it was even here in Morgan City since I've been here. And it's really a replica of the Vietnam Wall in Washington, D.C., but it goes all over the country, and there's a foundation that supports it. And, and so we, I was in the Rotary Club at that time, and we had some responsibilities with it. And, and so I went a couple of times, and I saw the wall, all the names, and uh, there was a tent or something set up where you could see where every name was located on the wall and uh, track people in your family, and, and it was kind of neat. And so I, I visited uh, the wall on a couple of occasions while I was there. And there was a guy that was in our church. Uh, he was a medic in Vietnam. Uh, at that point in time, he'd have been probably in his late 50s, early 60s. And he happened to be there one day when I went. I'll never forget this. And I, I saw him, and probably from here to you, Paul, I saw him by the wall. And he was in front of one of the panels. And he just stopped there. And he stared at it. And he had tears running down his face. And he saluted the wall. And I thought, those may have been names of people whose faces were embedded in his mind. There may have been some of them that he worked on as a medic on the battlefields of Vietnam. And he saw their names and remembered the day he couldn't save them. I did not approach him because he was in the middle of a moment. You see, for me, I was visiting a wall that commemorated sacrifice. For him, he was revisiting the event of sacrifice. Uh, today, I don't want to focus on the fallen U.S. soldier, although they deserve our honor. I want to think today of just the concept of sacrifice. Just the concept of it. Because I think as Americans, we, we get a lot from the freedoms that were paid for, but we don't think about how they were paid. And I think even as Christians, we are those who have received the grace of God from the cross, but maybe we do not even think about it as we should. Think about this. The present that you experience is only blessed because of past sacrifice. And the future will only be blessed by current sacrifice. You have the present you have because someone in the past, even that you don't know, sacrificed on a battlefield as well as a Savior on the cross. And today, as we proclaim the Savior on the cross, He calls us to be the sacrificers of this generation so that in a future generation they'll look back and say, I didn't know them, but I thank God for their sacrifice. I want to speak today on the subject, remember the sacrifice. Yes, thank the Lord for those who died on past battlefields. But I want you to know this, the battlefields that we talk about today do not all entail carrying guns. There's many battlefields of our day that don't have to do with uniforms or tanks our airplanes. Folks, today we have a battle for the soul of a nation. 
And in order for that to make a difference in the future, it requires us to be a people of sacrifice in our day. And so I want to look at several concepts related to that, certainly related to the Lord Jesus, the early church, but also a challenge to ourselves. Let's look at these things today as we remember the sacrifice. Number one, sacrifice is the cause of everything good in your life. Anything you have in your life, it had to come through sacrifice, either your sacrifice or someone else's sacrifice, but generally it's the combination of both. Because you don't have what you have only solely by other people's sacrifice. It's in combination with yours. I think that's why a lot of people are in trouble today. All they do is expect other people to sacrifice, and they don't want to be part of the equation. Sacrifice is required to have anything good. You want to do good in school? you got to sacrifice, right? You want to be good in sports? You've got to sacrifice to get your body in shape and get, get yourself ready to get on the field to play. You want to have a good marriage? You've got to sacrifice. You want to raise your kids right? You've got to sacrifice. You want your church to be healthy? You've got to sacrifice. Everything good comes from sacrifice. I remember the first economics course I took in college, probably the first or second meeting, here's what the teacher said. He said, there is nothing free in life. Everything is paid for by somebody else. Everything costs something. Wouldn't you agree with that? We like free things, don't we? We, we love free stuff. In, in fact, I um, got a phone call this morning. I was in the office, the phone rang. Somebody called, Are y'all doing Bible school this year? I said, yeah. Does it cost anything? I should have said, it costs an awful lot but you don't have to pay anything. I didn't say that, but I said there's no cost. The only cost is buying a t-shirt. And so here's the deal. Somebody's got to sacrifice to do Bible school, right? So that we can make it free to others who don't have to sacrifice. That is so true about everything that we, we do. I remember a number of years ago when we were renovating a sanctuary. Do you know it's been seven years, believe it or not, since we did that? I remember getting up as we were first raising funds for this, and I made the statement to the church. I said, when I got here as your pastor, the preschool building was paid for, this building was paid for, the gym was paid for, we didn't have any debt at all. I hadn't paid up to that point a dime for any of these buildings. I said, now it's my turn to pay. I am the beneficiary of somebody else's sacrifice. So every renovation we've done, I've given to it. And I can say this with the, the youth renovation. I gave every month to it from the time we started to the time we met the goal. You know what? Somebody sacrificed before me, and now it's my turn to sacrifice, right? Let me tell you, folks, and listen to me. If you're the guy who always is sucking off somebody else's sacrifice, it's time for you to get on board. Amen? We got so many people that just want it free. Everything is free. No, it is not. Listen to me clearly. If you want everything free, the way that you will pay for that is by losing your freedom. When you say, I want free, 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 it will come at the cost of your freedom. How do you keep freedom? Through sacrifice. Anything good in your life came through the sacrifice of somebody else. If you have it, it never really was free. When I think of uh, this weekend and um, Memorial Day, I, I think of the movie, I'm Saving Private Ryan. Many of you saw that. It came out 15, 20 years ago. Tom Hanks. It's fictitious, but it, it could have happened uh, about um, just a small band of uh, U.S. soldiers that go after a young man who's lost after the falling of the troops on D-Day. You know, they came behind enemy lines. They're misplaced all over the drop zone. And he lost, I think, three or four of his brothers, and he's the only one left. And so they got to go find Private Ryan so they can get him home. And I, at the very end of the movie, maybe you remember this, um, the, the, the character Tom Hanks plays... Um, he gets shot, and he's on the last moments of his life, and Private Ryan's right in front of him. And the last words out of Tom Hanks' character's mouth as he looks in the eyes of this soldier that he saved before he dies, he looks at him, remember what he said? Earn this. Earn this. Here's what he was saying. As I 
prepare to close my eyes in death for the rest of your life, earn my sacrifice. That's a pretty telling statement, isn't it? And then uh, the movie goes back to the, the beaches of Normandy. It shows the American cemetery there. And uh, Private Ryan's now an older man. He's there with his wife and his grandkids visiting the site. And he faces the tombstone of the man who died. And he looks at his wife in front of the tombstone. Remember this? And he says, have I been a good man? And she kind of realizes what he's doing, that in front of the man who died for him, who said to earn this, although he can't hear, so psychologically he's saying, please tell me that I earned his sacrifice. Here's what I wonder, church. As I think of the 14,000 people in the Chalmette National Cemetery, Tyler, you just went to Arlington. As you think of all of those buried there, I wonder how well we have earned all these people's sacrifice in our nation. And I think if we're honest about it, we haven't. Today I call on us to recognize the need for sacrifice. Let's um, look at our text in John 15, I'm sorry, in, in, in Matthew chapter 20, look at what Jesus says. Uh, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a, a ransom for many. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and here's what he's saying. Disciples, you've got to serve. I didn't call you to be superstars, I call you to be servants. I didn't come to serve, I came to serve. I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. I'm about to go to the cross to serve. I'm washing your feet because you need to serve. What's another word for serve? Sacrifice. You want to serve God, you got to sacrifice. We need to stop being a bunch of pansies in America that think somebody owes us something and understand this, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe Christmas is sacrifice. We celebrate it and sing joy to the world. The Lord has come. Did it cost him to come? Sure it did. He left the throne of glory to become like us. We got a host of problems. That's why he came. He left perfection to become like imperfection so that imperfection could be made perfect in him. That's that, that's sacrifice. He took on human form for 30 years to be scorned and mistreated throughout his life. Uh, that, that is sacrifice. Listen, everything about our faith is about sacrifice. So we come today, and I'm thankful we have air conditioning in South Louisiana. Uh, I don't think the Lord's calling us to turn the air off, praise God. Amen, I'm glad. Uh, we want the air conditioning. I, I think God would say, uh, I, I call you in to be comfortable so that you can go out and get uncomfortable. All right? But we, we need to be forewarned. If everything in our life's got to be comfortable, that there's got to be the perfect temperature in the building, and everything's got to be just right, and everything's got to be perfect. Listen, in this life, very little is perfect. Sacrifice is required in an imperfect world. In John 13, Jesus says, You call me teacher and Lord? And rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Right before he goes to the cross, Jesus says, uh, I've called you to be servants, to wash feet. When did you last serve anybody? Do you have the mindset to be a servant or to be be served. What's so sad in our country is, we've learned this, you know, during the whole COVID situation, the rich became richer. Have you noticed that? You ever read or see the reports? The rich became more and more wealthy as people were locked up in houses uh, so they wouldn't get sick. And I forget the statement I read, but it was talking about the number of millionaires that were created every day during COVID while many people couldn't even go to their jobs. 
You know, a lot of people have been self-serving even in our government. And I thank God for godly men and women who serve in our government offices. But we need more servants, folks, and less celebrities. We need guys who want to get their hands dirty instead of just getting a microphone in their mouth so they can look cute. And we need people to come more than just to church buildings. We need to know that sacrifice is getting our hands dirty when we say amen and leave the building. In John chapter 15, notice what uh, Jesus said, Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Lay down his life for his friends. The greatest love you can show is to lay down your life. That's the ultimate of sacrifice. Think about this. For those who died on battlefields, their last act of service was sacrifice. It's the last, last thing they did was sacrifice. I think about those young men on those Higgins boats that landed at Normandy. They woke up that morning and thousands of them didn't even make it off the beach. That, that morning they, they sacrificed. And yet today, let me just say this. We had young men who got on boats and crossed that strait from England to go to a beach to die. And yet a lot of people won't even get out of bed to come to church. Is that right? But Brother Steve, I got stuff to do, and it's the only day of the week I get to sleep in. Let me tell you right now, there's a lot of people that are sleeping in for the rest of their lives because they're not getting out of the ground. You know what I'm saying? Death. Let's be thankful for the sacrifices. Moms and dads, let's sacrifice that our kids would know the Lord. Let's make sure as a church, I'm, I'm thankful that, that the youth renovation is just days away from, from being at its completion. But sacrifice is more than in the renovation of facilities. It's in the renovation of lives. Let's make sure we sacrifice for that. Let's see the next thing. Jesus' sacrifice provided salvation for all who would believe. Anything good in life came from some sacrifice, from yours, from others, from the combination. But know this, the, the root of it is that Jesus died. Now let's think about that. The sacrifice of Jesus is a wonderful thing, but it's, it's a terrible thing. It's a wonderful thing because he died for us. It's a terrible thing because he had to. You know, God is love, yes. And God is just, yes. And, and God does take out his vengeance. But God took out his vengeance on his son. The ultimate vengeance for the sins of an ungodly people was to... Put the justice on the sinless Son of God. Jesus provided sacrifice so that we could believe. Notice uh, in our text in John 12, uh, Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. He says, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. For anything good to grow, he's saying there must be death, and his own death is a blessing to our lives. Folks, I'm a Christian not because I was good enough. I'm a Christian because he sacrificed enough. You'll never sacrifice enough to get saved. But his sacrifice was enough for you to get saved. There was no plan B. He was the only way. The ultimate sacrifice. Matthew 16, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and teachers of the law, 
that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. He's explaining, sacrifice is coming, my sacrifice is coming. He was also preparing them for their own sacrifice. Remember, as he's telling them about himself dying, uh, he's telling them about what's coming for them. His sacrifice means everything. By the way, you want to think about this? Why does the United States even exist? It's because the pilgrims wanted a place to have the freedom to do what? Worship. The founding of our nation had to do with the freedom to worship. The sacrifice they gave came for the the freedom of, of, of worship. And folks, guess what we have today? The freedom of worship. And it is not a guarantee that we keep it. If we learned anything from COVID, thank God it's, it's lifted for the most part. I mean, there's cases out there, but it's not what it was here a year ago. All over North America, we saw it in Canada especially, we saw it in some places in our own country, churches having people arrested for worshiping. And for the most part, a lot of places, people just complied. Listen to me very, very clearly. Church of Jesus Christ, never give up the freedom of worship. Never give up the freedom of worship. Far too many American soldiers died for you to have it. Don't give it up. Don't give it up. Jesus sacrificed so that we could be free. Soldiers sacrificed so you could live out that freedom. Let's see the third thing. Our spiritual forefathers provided a sacrificial legacy for our benefit. So we think about that. Uh, The church is built upon the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and then he ascends into heaven, and after Jesus goes up and the Spirit comes down and the church goes out, the persecution begins. You know, primarily throughout Jesus' ministry, he got some people that didn't like him, but they were intimidated by him because of his power. And then, of course, he's crucified. The disciples go into hiding, and then he he resurrects, and there's 40 days of teaching. They go 10 days into the, the upper room in prayer. At Pentecost, the Spirit comes down. And if you read, really, from there, Acts chapter 2, all the way into the end of the New Testament, challenge upon challenge upon challenge to the early church's faith. Was it ever easy in the New Testament? Really think about it. Acts over and over again, the church is oppressed. We have the prison epistles of Paul. Why? Because he was in jail when he wrote them. We have the book of Revelation that is John's vision of the the future as God gives to him, but he's exiled because he is a prisoner on a penal colony, on on an island. And then over and again we see people are oppressed all throughout the New Testament. Listen, it's not easy to be a Christian. We did not sign up for this to have warm fuzzies. The Old Testament is an ongoing story of men and women sacrificing for God. The Gospel is the Lord Jesus sacrificing for people. And the book of Acts and on is for the New Testament church to pay the sacrifice for the one who paid it all. And today we need that type of mindset. People my age and older, let me just say this. and um, you know, I'm in my 50s. You need to stick it out to the finish line. You hear me? Well, Brother Steve, I'm tired and I'm old. Well, guess what? You're going to heaven soon enough. Stick it out. Amen? He's going to give you a new body. And some of you might say, I need a new body. And I can look at you and say, you absolutely do. Looking at you. But until your body wears out and your breath leaves your chest, serve God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We, we need older people to, to, to hold the mantle all the way to the finish line. I'll tell you what discourages me. You, you, you have a lot of folks, and this is not a large percentage, but it is a large enough percentage, people that were faithful to God for 30 and 40 years, and, 
And for whatever reason, they retire from God when they retire from work, and they, they, they graduate from church, and they become lazy and apathetic, and they don't fight the fight anymore. And when they finally cross the finish line, their energy has been gone for years. Finish the race. Amen? The sacrifice is to the finish line. I was thankful when I did my dad's funeral that he fought the good fight. He finished the course. He kept the faith. Praise God for that. We, we need to do that. Why Our spiritual forefathers gave us an example of that. If you look at the modern Christian church, this is well after the, the New Testament. Let me throw some names at you. William Carey, Adoniram Judson, Hudson Taylor, Jim Elliott, Lottie Moon, David Livingston. All of those are famous because all of those sacrificed greatly. Think about the common factor. If you want to be remembered greatly for God, you probably had to sacrifice greatly for God. Those who make a difference on their world are, are people who are willing to sacrifice. Ruthie, you're trying to make me feel guilty today? No, I'm trying to challenge you today. I, I just look at our culture, and here's what I think about the culture has taught us to be apathetic. The culture has taught us to disengage. The culture has told the church, you know, do what you want, fine. Just keep it within the doors of your building and, and let the world do its own things. Let me tell you right now, church, if we don't live the faith outside of these walls, the day's coming where we're going to be threatened about living the faith inside of these walls. Live the faith. We follow the example of Jesus on the cross. We, we see the example of the disciples before us. Jesus even warns us of this in our text. John 16, all this I have told you so that you will not go astray. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he's offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. Here's what he's saying. I'm about to die, and they're about to want to kill you. So I warn you before it comes. You know what? I think we, we need to get to the point as believers, and just take this for what it's worth. We need to not care what the world thinks anymore. I don't give a rip what you think, Mr. Politician, Mr. Corporate Leader. I, I don't care what you think. I care what he thinks. Listen, if, I, if I'm right with God, that's really all that matters. I'm not going to be perfect by any means. We, we, we're, we're human. We're going to make mistakes. But we need to seek to please God rather than appease the world. Jesus said, listen, they're going to come for you. Look at what Paul says about his journey as a believer. 2 Corinthians 11. Look at this long list of sacrifice. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak? And I do not feel weak. Who is led into sin? And I do not inwardly burn. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. Here's what he's saying. I'm not bragging about my pain. I'm just letting you know sacrifice is not optional. Paul was not a casual Christian. We've got far too much casual Christianity today. What, what is a casual Christian, Brother Steve? Well, a casual Christian fits God into their busy schedule. A committed Christian lets God dictate their schedule. A casual Christian lets God be on their top ten list. A committed Christian has God at the top of the list. 
A, a casual Christian sanitizes themselves enough to come to church, but a, a real Christian is sanitized when they go to work and they go to school and they interact with family. You see, some of you are casual Christians because you're just sanitized enough to get into the church building today. But when you go home and when you're at work, you're a casual Christian because you might get scorned for being a religious freak. Listen to me. I thank God that men and women died on foreign fields so I could be a religious freak. Brother Steve, you're stepping on it today, aren't you? Let me tell you right now. A lot of people stepped on foreign fields so we could walk the gospel faith. Thank God for the sacrifice of Jesus and thank God for the sacrifice of those who came before us. But let me tell you, there's sacrifice today in the church. What is our sacrifice today? Let's think about a couple of things. It's a sacrifice to be a Sunday school teacher. I mentioned this a week or two ago. We're always going to need Sunday school teachers because we're always going to have people that eventually can't do it. You can't do it the rest of your life because there's limitations. We're going to need people to step up. Listen to me. And that means you might have to commit to being at Sunday school the majority of Sundays. Well, brother, see, that's the main reason I don't want to do it. I don't want to be tied down. Not that I can't do it. I just don't want to be tied down. Okay. What does that mean? It's not worth the sacrifice. That's what that means. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to help at Bible school. But see, that's five days. That's five days. You know, I got other things I want to do. I don't want to be tied down. I could do it. I have the skills, the ability. I just don't, I don't, I don't want to do it. I don't want to be a children's and youth worker and have to go on trips. It's going to steal my vacation time. Dwayne, how many weeks you and Karen get to vacation time on youth trips? Huh? A bunch. Yeah. I don't want to be a kitchen worker, a maintenance worker, a yard worker. I don't want to be a musician on the stage. I don't want to do anything because it will tie me down. I am so thankful that Jesus got tied down for me. Understand this, church. God calls us to sacrifice. Let's see the last thing. Sacrifice is the call for everyone who claims to follow Jesus. Sacrifice is what we're all about. Do you know, um, we're, we're in a day of much marketing in the church. Uh, I go to conferences and things, and this is a good thing and a bad thing. You know what marketing is? Marketing is making you want something you don't have. One of the most effective commercials in my childhood, and I forget it, it was a Coca-Cola commercial. And there's a bunch of guys working on the highway, and you can see the steam rising off the concrete. Y'all can probably see this. And, and this guy is just dripping wet, and he, he reaches into this ice chest, and he's got a glass bottle of Coke. By the way, that's the best way to drink a Coke in a glass bottle, a green glass bottle with a real top that pops. And he gets it, and he, he, it's sweating. You can see the sweat dripping down the bottle, and... He's drinking, and the camera angle shows his Adam apple popping in and out as he is gulping the Coke down. And I'm watching that, and I'm thinking, I want that. Right? You know what I'm talking about? When we went to Haiti those two years, Steve, remember that? They had real cane sugar Coca-Colas in Haiti. Not the high fructose corn syrup, have you know. The real cane syrup. We drank that and that was really, it was awesome. We'd come back every day to the place where we stayed and we got the real deal Coca-Cola. And I thought, yes. But let's think about the, the biblical model is not to market what you like. It's to market more than that. Let's think about this. Let's, this could be our new commercial for Bayou Vista Baptist Church. I wrote this down. Let's see what you think. We, we can put this on the air. Come join us at Bayou Vista Baptist Church, where we preach a message that counters our world and offends millions of people. <laughs> Find out about sin in your life and how to please God. Hear about how God took on human form and died a bloody, cruel death on the cross. Come and make new friends while you lose old friends. Also, come to serve others strictly for the joy of doing so. In addition, we want you to give your money. How would that be for a commercial? <laughs> 
Wouldn't that be a great commercial? <laughs> Brother Steve, that's not going to attract people. They don't want to give anything. They just want to get. Oh. So this is what the commercial would be. Come to buy you Vista Baptist Church. Recently renovated sanctuary. Newly renovated youth department. We have vacation Bible school. We have programs for all the kids. We have good music. We, we have this and that. We want you to come. And we never tell you what it's going to cost you. You ever thought about that? Most advertising is high on the benefits and low on the cost. Come to Bayou Vista Baptist Church and take up your cross and follow Jesus. Why don't you come with us and pick up your cross at the door? Sacrifice is the call of everyone who claims to follow Jesus. Let's end by reading Luke 14. This is probably the most in-your-face statement Jesus makes to a crowd about sacrifice. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciples. I suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. That's a tough passage. Hate your father, mother, sister, brother. Here's what he's really saying. Put me first. Don't let anybody else come ahead of me. Count the cost because it's going to cost you to follow me. Don't start and quit midway. Pay the price from the beginning, knowing, God, I surrender all. And know this, if you don't give up everything, you cannot be his disciple. I hear this every Memorial Day. Maybe you hear it. Some gave all, but all gave some. You've heard that before? Some gave all, but all gave some. When it comes to your faith, what would we say about you? How close are you to giving all? And how many of you are just giving some, but are willing to give all? Sacrifice. Are you a casual Christian? Thank God for those we celebrate tomorrow, but today is Sunday. You know every Sunday is Memorial Day? It really is. Every Sunday is Memorial Day. We remember the Savior who died on the cross. And that's why we worship on Sunday is the day of resurrection. We celebrate the fact that we can have eternal life because the one who died rose again. Jay, we just baptized you a minute ago. We, we baptized, think about it, the two most significant ordinances of the church are remembrances of sacrifice. Baptism signifies death. The Lord's Supper signifies death. We're based upon sacrifice. And now we give an invitation. You know what the invitation's about every service? Can you tell me? What's the word? Sacrifice. What is an altar? An altar is a place of sacrifice. What do you put on an altar? Something that is dead. Today, here's what I call you to do. We have an invitation. Paul's going to join me here in just a second as Tyler comes. Uh, maybe you just need to come to the, the altar and say, God, uh, at one time I was on the altar, but I've squirmed off the altar. It's time to, to recommit myself. So don't come to me. Come to the altar. I'll pray with you if you want. That's fine. Paul will. He'd be glad to. But maybe some of you just need to say, Master, I am a retreating sacrifice. I've backed away. And now it's time to get reengaged. Some of you might need to get saved. Maybe you need to do what Jay did last Sunday and come forward because he came right at the start of the invitation. Come and say, today I want to be that sacrifice to Jesus.
I want you to stand. I want you to bow your heads and contemplate. We're not going to.